Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, on behalf of the Evergreen Outreach Committee, I'd like to welcome you to uh, day three, second session of the Evergreen International Online Conference. Uh, we'd like to thank Mobius for sponsoring track one today and Equinox Open Library Initiative for sponsoring the closed captioning for the conference. If you're not familiar with Zoom's webinar controls, please take a moment to acquaint yourself with them. Um, at Elizabeth's request, I am going to be promoting all attendees to um, panelists so that you can share your videos uh, and start your own mics so that you can have some conversation. Uh, you can also feel free to use the Q&A or the chat for questions um, or to uh, interact with each other. That's fine as well. Um, and if you do use the chat, please make sure to set the two drop down to all panelists and attendees rather than all panelists. Um, this session is being recorded and the recording will be available on the Evergreen Project YouTube channel after the conference. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth McKinney, who is uh, leading our consortium leaders roundtable. Take it away. Thank you, Debbie. <clears throat> and so there we go. So we can all start video. And it says I'm unable to start video. There we go. And then if you're not familiar, then you can actually go to um, the tiled view in the upper right hand corner. So is everyone able to start your video? I'm still working on getting them. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm pushing. I'm pushing. I'll, I have to do them all individually. So. Oh no. Okay. Just a few more. Okay. Second. Okay. Okay. You should all be able to start your videos now. So thank you, Debbie. And I'm sorry if I if I wasn't clear when when we chatted that. This was really an online meeting and we all needed to be able to see and speak because it's, it's not a presentation. This is always a group discussion. So I sent a link. I had a link in there for possible uh, topics of discussion. And this is for all of us. So uh, we can start with whatever you want to do. Um, if anyone has any ideas, then just go ahead and let's get started. You don't have to choose from what I put on the list. Let's just it's open-ended just for so we can learn from each other and share what we're doing and maybe do some collaborative work. So, 
Anybody? So nobody's going to speak up. I'm going to have crickets. Okay. So, so I would, I would, I'll just say, I would like to hear what everyone's experience with the, the, the COVID virus has been in terms of, you know, managing a consortium and the things that you ran into, you know, maybe some things with your budget that you're expecting. And then even if you have plans for a, another outbreak that would require you to, to close again. Uh, so I know in Georgia, we had a shelter in place for six weeks. And we had to do a lot of work on our side to change settings for the libraries. You know, just uh, we got rid of you know that long overdue. We, we didn't have that. We uh, stopped printing notices. We uh, changed the patron card expiration dates. Uh, we kept moving that out. So it looks like one of the repercussions of that is that we kept extending all of our uh, patron card expiration dates. So on September 30th, we're going to have 4,000 cards that expire all at once. So that's going to be fun. Yeah, we, ex uh, <laughs> so, we extended all, all of our patron expiration states to July 1st. Yeah. So right now we have libraries complaining about everybody calling them saying the card, library card has expired. What can we do about it? I'm like, there's not much we can do about it at this point. Um, so, there's no way to go through and sort them and say, yeah. these expire on this date, these expire on this date, this many expire on that date. Right. If we could just have all the A's expire on September 25th, the B's on September 26th. <laughs> but you still run into that same issue, though. Of... <laughs> we but, ended up, you know, sort of letting all of the different systems, you know, we've got now about 40 different library systems. And so we ended up sort of developing a a list of things that we're able to do, like freeze holds, do um, hard boundaries, all that kind of stuff. And then kind of did surveying and said, of these options, you know, do you want to put a banner in your pack? Do you want to extend your due dates for your patrons? Do you want to remove fines? Do you want to go to fine free policies? And it was a little bit crazy trying to wrangle everyone's responses, but that way people could kind of do it the way that they wanted to do it. Um, so is that a document you could share with us? Sure, I've got it on a page. That would be I'll great. Put because when we've been talking about a, you know, plan for another closure or you, yeah. know, you know god forbid another pandemic so we, we we've really been talking about that a lot and kind of what could we do different next time i think we handled it well by and large um i just want to say a quick shout out to all of you guys that are consortium leaders i know as a member of nc cardinal it was traumatic from the library perspective trying to keep up with everything and then just they had that form that we just went through every couple of weeks and this is what we're doing now and this is what we're doing now and I don't know how you guys kept on top of that many different libraries this is all we could do to keep track of one <laughs> thank you for recognizing that because it was it was really busy uh, yeah and it, and it never it never really calmed down <laughs> it, we still it, haven't stopped no we're working no, on it four days <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's so, like I'm gonna now we have now we have libraries reopening, and one of reopening holds and all that, and so it's the whole process, but in reverse now. Mm -hmm. And then you get questions: Why is this not working? I'm like, um, do we go look and says, okay, well, we need to reset. You need to reset this, this, and this, and why haven't you? And they go, oh, we forgot. Mm -hmm. right. And yeah, and so you know, what was the experience with closed dates? We found we had to do it by branches rather than by systems. When we started yeah. with systems, it didn't it didn't actually work, especially for brand, uh, for systems that have thirteen branches or that kind of thing. So we right yeah, that's what we found is that we had to do it by systems, not branches. Because the first thing we did was roll it out by systems because that was we the first thing we actually did was roll it out consortial wide. That didn't work. Then we rolled it out by system. That didn't work. <laughs> Then we finally did it by branches and it worked. Yeah, uh, Bibliomation is, you know, it's a bunch of independent libraries for the most part. So it, we <laughs> left it up to them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that had some success to it. <laughs> well, when you're talking about 120, we have 128 systems right now. 
they, we, we couldn't leave it up to individuals. Mm. At Noble, yeah. when we started, we, we uh, did it you know, system-wide. We've got 26 independent libraries and just did it. It was a learning experience for us going through all the different settings and figuring out how it should work and what all the interrelationships were. And we really couldn't ask libraries, uh, 26 libraries, and wait for answers. We just kind of did it blanket, told them what we were doing. Um, and that was for a while. We kept extending out the library card expirations and the due dates and, and all of that. And now finally, just this past Monday, our libraries are starting to reopen with, with curbside service. Um, and so now we're, yeah, as you say, undoing what we're doing, but now everyone is kind of doing their own thing. And they're all up in the air because they're being independent libraries. They're taking their cues from City Hall, Town Hall, uh, the College yeah. Administration. Yeah. And so now it's trying to keep everyone uh, and people aren't telling us, you know, when they're opening, uh, that they are opening. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, so it's uh, a little whack-a-mole right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I mean, because I'm the one that's doing actually the actual, putting it in the software. I have like sheets of paper with this, which branches of which systems would be done. So I'm, no, I'm not going back and redoing a system and or making sure I get all the systems I need to do that day done. So it's 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 I mean just keeping up with what has been done and what who has been done, what hasn't been done, and what needs to be done per system. It, it's it's been a fairly complex procedure. We have a Google Sheet that we were using where we listed each system and we list, yeah. listed the options. And then we try to keep track of ticket numbers and then notes fields and, you know, and it, it's, it's, you know, it, it works for about the second or third iteration of making changes. Yeah. But then after a while, you know, it's, it's hard to keep it's track. It's chaos. I just kept track each day. I kept track. I need to do this system and gets this done. This system's this done. This system gets this done. And it's a standard sheet of paper that I just hand wrote everything. I just found it much more efficient than trying to keep out track of all that, trying to type it all in his computer where I can just scribble it all out on a sheet of paper. Because it's ephemeral information anyway at this point. I'm I use the, the information. Same boat, <laughs> Lynn, with uh, handwriting everything because I tried to do that as well. But it's kind of pointless for me to keep track of everything electronically because I don't need to share it with anybody. I'm just by myself managing 100 libraries. So, <laughs> I mean, I do have a. We do have a staff here at Evergreen, Indiana, but a lot of it is just, yes, they, I mean, Anna did, did do a lot of the gathering of data and she did put it in a spreadsheet. Then she handed the spreadsheet off to me. Then I took that spreadsheet and actually interpreted it into what needed to be put into Evergreen. So it was just easier for me just to scribble notes on a sheet of paper and that made sure I got, because I could go in and put when things need to be do, done later on a different sheet of paper. When I got the information, I could put it on a different sheet of paper. Like on this date, these things, I can start putting in other, it was just much more easier, efficient, just use a, just a sheet of paper. Then we had to, to um, coordinate with the statewide courier when they would start delivering materials and bring the backlog yeah. stuff from the warehouses. And I'm, I'm from uh, Missouri Evergreen and we reached, a, I guess, a tipping point when a certain number of libraries had reopened again, where it made sense for the statewide courier to start bringing things again. Yeah, well, I mean, we had the same thing with the statewide courier is that when Indiana is just totally shut down. When we, we were literally, Indiana was, the state of Indiana was open one day, it was shut down the next. Um, at that point, we had to shut down the courier service. We had to shut down lots of things really quickly. And so, but when um, the governor and all his wisdom people, they opened, they, we started a rolling opening. Um, we sat down and started looking at when the courier service could start back. And because, I mean, we had libraries who were wanting the courier service while we were closed, but we shut the whole courier, but the courier service had to be shut down because of the state shutdown. But as soon as we were able to open up the courier service, some of those libraries who never closed during the pandemic, um, we're glad for the courier service to come back. Even though they couldn't get hold from anywhere else, but hey. 
and we did have a few libraries still open. And something that we ran into with our courier service is that when we did the actual shelter in place, then all of our libraries closed. So we had to close down the courier service, but we had about 3000 square feet worth of books that had nowhere to go because all the libraries were closed. So then we had to scramble to amend our contract to, to pay them to store our materials because, you know, we, we didn't have like, you know, the, the equipment to, to move the material. And so then that was a whole new learning process. And I think it's changed the way I'll do contracting forever and that you know, I need to have an emergency plan in place no matter what happens to a contract. So uh, I, we're working on our third amendment now. And so I'm going to have um, a plan that would include uh, you know, just paying for warehousing in the event of a, another closure. And then we have uh, another service level because the universities don't intend to reopen until the fall. So right now we're just paying for the public library side of things. So that's a higher rate. But then once the universities join with us again, then our rate can go down. So that was kind of a whole new thought experiment on contracting. So were you on the hook to continue paying them at the same rate that you had been paying them for normal services or was it like mileage and therefore when the mileage stopped? Um, so we we normally pay them on a per stop basis. So they they go to about seventy locations per day uh, for the public libraries, and and we do this in in conjunction with the university libraries, which there's about thirty uh, university libraries. So um, when we completely shut down with the shelter, the formal shelter in place, we we just paid them for the warehouse space and then a little bit for staffing to staff the, where we have three warehouses in the state. And so we paid for the, the staff at the warehouse. So we were just skating by. Luckily our stuff didn't get thrown out on the street. <laughs> I mean, that's basically what we had to do was we paid for warehousing and then, um, but as soon as the courier started back opening and, because he actually, our courier was also the courier for a lot of our medical facilities. So he was able to take the couriers that he would use oh, for us and re redo the, reuse them. So he wasn't losing any money. Yeah, that's um, good. But, but he still had to, there was still a certain number of drivers that he couldn't use because he didn't have, because not only does Evergreen Indiana use the courier service, but our statewide, um, uh, CERCS, which is our state statewide circulation resource sharing um, group, which is different than Evergreen, Indiana. Uh, they use the same courier service, which includes all our universities and public libraries that are not part of Evergreen, Indiana and stuff. Um, so yeah, so as soon as the, I mean, the, our universities, some of our university libraries are started back opening, but most of them aren't. So Diane in Missouri, did do y'all have a self-contained courier system or do you share with, with other industries? It's shared, that's for sure. <laughs> the little guys in their little cars that come to pick up <laughs> hundreds of boxes and find out their car's not big enough. Yeah, they sh we share a courier with other businesses. Yeah, yeah ours is self-contained. So when we shut down, we, we really shut down. It, it is, do other people do something differently? I mean, ours is shared, so. We use UPS for our resource sharing. Oh, wow. Do y'all have a contract or do you just like, everyone has to pay their own? No, we have a state contract uh, through the state library that gives it at probably close to 66% uh, to maybe, uh, um, um, Re, re, uh, lower amount. Uh huh. So you would pay 66% per, or you would pay 66% less? We would pay about 40%, 33% oh, wow. of what it actually costs if you were just to ship it commercially. Oh, that's sweet. Now, do you subsidize that or do you, did the libraries pay that out of their budget? We pay that as the, as the program, as part of our budget. And we basically cover that through our LSTA and member contributions. Nice. Very nice. Do they get tracking? Uh, I think you can track, but it's not something that we have any sort of interface for them to be able to 
know what's coming to them or you know they can they can track their their packages it's a one-way tracking um we have a whole package tracking system that we've developed in-house to go with our um our system so have any of y'all looked i think um there was some talk about doing a, a curbside uh, function in Evergreen, and also there's another one, um, curbside and then uh, self-checkout. Have, have any of y'all looked at that? Um, I know we talked about curbside some, was it yesterday or the day before? Tuesday, I think it was. Okay. Yeah. Um, I missed that. I don't... Hi, this is Jennifer right. with uh, Pales. The curbside module for Evergreen um, was funded by Pales. It's an accelerated development and it is currently being tested oh, wow. um, by Pales and will be released for testing um, on a public server, I believe, next week. Um, so that will, it's not going to be around in time for any of my libraries but <laughs> it was just kind of like this needs to happen anyway so <laughs> so jennifer are all your libraries gonna completely reopen before it's released is that uh yes um the last of our counties went into a yellow phase at the end of last week the majority um, are actually now in green and they could reopen their buildings if they wanted to, but they are mostly still doing their own ad hoc mm -hmm. curbside. Um, some of them aren't even doing that. They're just accepting returns and then, you know, doing the extended quarantine process, et cetera. Um, so it's been interesting. <laughs> um, I started this position uh, right as COVID was going nuts. And, um, and then my supervisor, who was the only other uh, person working in Pales uh, managing all of this, also left then a couple of weeks after I started. So I have been uh, managing this situation uh, with COVID since the beginning and uh, <laughs> largely by myself. <laughs> um, Carrie was really great, but when she had to leave, it was like, oh no. <laughs> well, I mean, anytime you need to tap into one of us, come right ahead. <laughs> so we have a, a consortial leaders um, email group, and I think Benjamin set that up for us. Um, I didn't do join that. that we could get you in, in touch and so you can join that group. Ben, put me on that list. Yes, ma'am. Yes, please do put me on that as well. Because I started in Evergreen, Indiana in October of last year. So, uh, sorry, Ben. Uh, they got me before you did. <laughs> <laughs> we tried. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Lynn and Jennifer, could you send me your email addresses? Yeah, I will. I'll just, yeah, I'll just type it right here. So I see in the notes, Benjamin shared um, his document, a, a resource that he has for his libraries, and that's very helpful. I'm going to uh, share that with the team, so we, we might do some copying there, Benjamin. Feel free. And then, and then so Sharon is that is that a support document for uh, Sitka is that is that what that is that's right it's our web page that support nice. put together for all things COVID-19 nice. um, libraries and we, we support over 90 multi-type independent libraries in Western Canada so um, because of the regionalization um, uh, libraries were opening and closing at very different times so uh -huh. it's a little bit of an a la carte menu at times right now right wow yeah. thanks for sharing that so. we just when when all this started we just went to the our um evergreen indiana board and just said look this is what we we as the admin group recommend us do and they said okay this is what we're going to do and then we just said we told everybody else this is what we're going to do <laughs> for a lot of the stuff like all the closures and everything we just went okay this is what we're going to do across the board and be done with it. 
Yeah, we did um, in Spark Pails, we did very much, you know, similar things. You know, we extended patron expiration dates until July 1st, and we turned off pretty much all of our notices, print and email. And um, we used the emergency closing handler to extend everything as well. And at first, they were doing it on their own. And then you know, in the end, I just had to go through and do each one individually myself because they made some really interesting decisions in the uh, beginning because they were hoping that they would be open and back to normal so much sooner than we really oh, yeah. were. <laughs> <clears throat> they thought two weeks we'll be back open. No. Right. And, you know, so we ended up extending those dates like three times, some of them four. And, um, and then, you know, we ran into this issue where, you know, the answer to all things going wrong is July 1st. All the patrons are expiring on July 1st. All of the items are due back on July 1st. Um, and so it was like 200,000 plus items due on July 1st alone for the majority of the li libraries, not even all of them. And then that was like, well, we can't just turn the notices back on to handle that. And so um, I don't really, <sighs> They didn't want to stagger due dates, which was, you know, my first proposal. Um, you could stagger the due dates, you could turn on your notices, and boom, you're back to normal. But no, they didn't want to do that. They wanted their stuff back. And then I was like, well, then we're going to have to do a one-time courtesy notice that is sent out hopefully at least 30 days before July 1st to get the system started to accept returns again. Because with so many of our patrons, they're just out of touch and no longer thinking about that pile of books in their house if they even oh. know where it is. Um, <laughs> you know, so how do you get them to start returning their stuff and not all on July 1st? Um, so that's been a process where every day I've been going in and setting up a new uh, one-time courtesy notice targeting July 1st for a new library system and sending it out and making sure it doesn't stall or anything. Still ongoing. Well, we didn't turn off any of our notices or anything, so. Oh, do you have any uh, interesting dates? <laughs> yeah, all items are due July 1st. <laughs> so, yeah, those notices sometimes, I mean, I'm just waiting on the, the one that comes out the three days before and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, I looked at that and <laughs> I was like, there's no way. A lot of our, uh, a lot of our libraries are also accepting, um, materials back already yeah so we, we have a lot of materials coming back and and i look at the daily counts and yeah we have a lot of materials coming back yeah and so um when i before i started doing the courtesy notice 30 days ahead of time we had um just under well we might have actually temporarily for two days been just over 200 th uh, thousand items um then one and a half weeks in after starting the 30 day courtesy notices, we've got about 50,000 of them back. So <laughs> that's much, much more yeah. <laughs> reassuring. <laughs> back as in they bounced? Uh, or no, as oh, in they've the been returned. Yeah, oh, I mean, most okay. of the libraries now in the yellow phase, they're accepting returns, even if they're not doing checkouts. Um, there, a lot of them were not doing returns at all. And during this time, since there were no notices active, nobody was getting reminded that they had stuff out, you know, about anything. So the courtesy notice just, it was less of a courtesy notice and just, it actually literally said in the subject line, your library is accepting returns. And, you know, explained about the possible, it'll be on your account for three days after you return it because of quarantine procedures. And then it gave them a list of titles and due dates and that date was 30 days in the future. So they didn't feel this huge pressure to return everything all at once, which was what we were trying to avoid. That's really nice. That was a good, that was a good plan. I like that. Yeah. So I see that Benjamin suggested he was interested in some other topics. So I will, I'm going to look at Benjamin and say, pick one and run okay. with it. Let's see. Um, <laughs> So the shared repository of wiki or consortial administration best practices. I feel like that's something um, that this group uniquely would be able to do. 
you know, we have some of our kind of internal documentation that we have as a program. And, I, I, you know, I, I'm, you know, what, I, I'm kind of interested to think about like what, um, what kind of share, what things would, would be um, similar enough among different consortia that might be of use to have, um, you know, there are some more specific things like, you know, the migration practices that, you know, was another topic in um, maintaining bibliographic standards and some of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, just, just brainstorming, what kind of other things do you all think would be um, the kinds of things that would be uh, transferable or, or shareable across different consortia? Well, I think most immediate is going to be an emergency response to closures, which that, that was something that, you know, like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I think we did okay, but, you know, I just wanted to yeah. kind of see what other people were doing. And so that could be, that could be one, definitely one thing, you know, to share what our, our response was, the things that we, we chose. And like our closed date handling did not do so well for 302 libraries. So it's good to hear what other people have done. Um, but yeah, the, now, and we can share our process for adding libraries. We're uh, part of our strategic plan. We're looking at um, adding more, more libraries. And so I don't know if you know the history in Georgia that we, we added all the small libraries to Pines first, and now we're easing up to like Atlanta, Fulton County, which is probably, it would like double our population. Yeah. So we, we we're putting together a documentation and timeline because we find that most library systems go out to bid. They have this RFP process for selecting a vendor, and we don't work like that at all. We're no. a state agency. It's 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 it's, it's a, not a good fit. So we wanted to give them some documentation so that if they could actually look at being a part of Pines now, they're going to have to plan like you know a year and a half out for that. So so we we are putting together that timeline, and that's something I'm happy to share in terms of all the steps, how long it takes in that process to, to migrate. And then I'm looking at uh, plan and then, um, yeah. So, I mean, th that's something else that definitely we could share from the Pines end. Elizabeth, yeah, I'd be really interested in, in seeing that. So thank you for being willing to share that because yeah, that's, uh, we're in the same, yet. <laughs> yeah, but, but thank you in advance. I mean, we've migrated since I even started in October, we've, we've migrated three other libraries in Evergreen, Indiana. Um, and we just approve our the next migration. But it's gonna be the one we're focusing on those small libraries that don't have IT staff, that don't have um, have really bad old catalogs that have been around forever and have never been upgraded. Um, so I mean the process I mean the process from going from somewhere like Fulton County versus uh, Princeton County Library, which is, I think they have like 1,500 items. I mean, it's small. Yeah. And we're just going to catalog them in. Um, we have cataloging parties where we go out to their library and we sit there with their books on their shelves and sit there and catalog them into Evergreen. Um, there's like six of us that go out. And we can go out for the day and do nothing but catalog all day. Um, two, I mean, well, we can migrate the data over. Um, they're coming from a fairly modern system, something like Cersei Donix, Horizon, um, Triple I. Um, so we, we run, we still run the gamut every every chance. I mean, every. Do y'all have, have a formal project plan that you use for that, or do you just? Go by the seat of your pants because I'll say sometimes in pines we just go by the seat of our pants. A lot of it's seat of the pants. <laughs> a lot because a lot of it is depending on the system they're migrating from. How much data can we pull out of that system? Um, because like it's a it's an ILS called ABC. Um, we cannot pull data out of that system whatsoever. So we have to mig we have to catalog them in and start fresh um, where if we have someone who has like Horizon or Cersei Dynex, yes, we can pull that data out or file it 
we can pull that data out. We have the scripts and everything to pull that data out and migrate the data in. Um, but and like I said, it really just, it is depending on the library, the ILS they're migrating from and, and all that. So if it's um, for, for us, it, when we were working with our previous vendor, um, we relied pretty heavily on them for a lot of the migration, not only the nuts and bolts database work and, and extract transact load kind of stuff, but also the project management and that kind of thing. And we now have taken that on as, a, as NZ Cardinal, um, the, the project management stuff. Um, and so we kind of have a 10 week or 10 call schedule leading up to go live. We have our training scheduled in there. We have our OPEC right. stuff. Um, and then we have like four follow-ups and we've got Google Docs for the questions that we asked. So that's the kind of stuff that we could share um, with you all if you would find that useful. We um, have we have a lot of those documents that we've created internally and I has them all because um, Anna's the one who does take who is the project lead on most of these migrations. Um, me and Bob, my uh, database administrator, we uh, we just do the back the, behind the scene work. You know, but to back around then that that I guess you know that that's a, that's another category of, of stuff that we can we can share. Any other thoughts on Benjamin's question about a, a shared repository? Or I mean, there's a, there's always things that we could share, especially I'm thinking of because we we deal with things in such a large, not an individualistic library setting, but a larger setting. And there's things that change when you look at things in social versus when you think of things locally. Um, I was just thinking of um, things like holds policy. I mean, everybody does holds policies different. Every social does holds policies different. Um, I've been to where from working with one system that every library sets their own holds policies to every Indiana where it's set. Um, for social wide with some variations in, in there, a little bit of variation in there. Um, well, where I started off is in Pines where everything is set consortial. <laughs> so there's, there's definitely things like that that we can share. Um, I was thinking a holds policy circulation matrix is, I mean, they're all going to be different in some way, but going back and looking at how another consortium has looked has has done this um to me makes a it allows me to get my head around a consortial environment rather than a individualistic library system environment it made me think too that you know with the with the things happening with covid and such um i didn't think to go to the consortial leaders list and communicate there but that might have been a useful conversation as we were, I mean, so much of it was just like, you know, your head's in the- Yeah, we were just focused. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing where sharing that stuff sometimes maybe even not, not you know, it's, it's harder to document, but you are doing documentation that's focused towards your community. Um, but that may be a place where, hey guys, this is what we're encountering. We found that the branches that the the um, closing editor doesn't work really good at the systems. Right. Did you guys, you know, have you figured that out yet too kind of stuff? Um, maybe even just sort of documentation on the fly kind of thing. I think I opened a bug ticket for the it doesn't work on the system level. <laughs> okay. <laughs> need to get up some heat. I'll, I'll go find that ticket and definitely macro confirmed and it applies to me the whole shebang. <laughs> I'll see if I can share it. <laughs> well. Yeah, I, had, I, I think I sent one email about what people are going to do as far as quarantining materials, and there, it was crickets. I think everyone was just like, ah, <laughs> in that mode. So no one wanted to talk about quarantining materials. But <laughs> yeah. I think our suggestion from the State Library was two days, yeah. 48 hours. Yeah, I, I tried to keep up with the CDC and what UPS, the USPS, and everyone else were doing, but you know, we figured it out. So let and, me check the... um, something else that came up, um, I did a wish list was um, a lot of libraries are going to be doing 
um, backdating or effective date setting kind of for the long term because of quarantine. So every day you're going to be backdating potentially for three days, anything that you check in. And they talked about um, how it would be nice if that could be sticky a little bit more somehow because it, it falls away very quickly. Right. Every time you close that window and open it up, it's gone. Yeah. And coming from that public library frontline staff person, well, not that that's what I was doing, but um, having to work that occasionally, I liked the fact that it wasn't sticky because I had, we had staff that would just go in and set the back date and always set the back date. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'd go through and close it. Every time I see it, no, these things should not be backdated. <laughs> but now we kind of have a situation now, where that's exactly what we want to happen. <laughs> and so let's see, we have a, we, Jennifer shared the launch pad bug and then we're going to, I'd be interested in hearing thoughts on long-term strategies for evergreen development. One that I don't see addressed for development is Bibframe. That's from Sharon. Hmm, Bibframe. And then, then you can see what CW Mars and Noble said in response. Um, I do not know enough about it to talk about Bibframe, but I know that Elaine Hardy, uh, who is um, with Pines, has been on this uh, stump for quite a while. So I can refer so I can refer you to Elaine as an ally. And if we can throw Pines dollars towards it, we're happy to do so. But now Sharon, y'all are part of the Evergreen uh, Development Initiative, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that it's one place that we could bring this, but I think there we need some depth of expertise uh, so Elaine might be a place to start because I think we need to have a shared understanding of what what do we want uh, to do with Big Bib Frame? What do we want to, this to look like? Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't have that depth of expertise, um, and and it's a question I can bring to the to the community development table. But um, it's surfacing more and more as uh, other vendors are actually addressing it and making statements about what they're doing. And we don't have any such thing in the Evergreen community. And bibframe has been around for a long enough time now that I think we, we need to really start tackling that. So um, right. thank you for the, for the suggestion of Elaine. I, it wouldn't be really, um, I wasn't aware that there was um, a consortial leaders uh, email list. So that's great. Uh, I think it would be really helpful if, if this table could meet you know, maybe even three or four times a year just to throw some of those ideas around because I'm, I'm really uh, interested in that strategic thinking around um, where we're going with Evergreen. And right. sometimes we get very focused on new features, new features. And there's a lot of, um, you know, what's going on in the wider technology world. Uh, there, there's just a lot of expertise that needs to come to bear uh, about how we move forward um, and, and trying to keep pace with what's going on in the in the commercial vendor environment and and making sure that we're not lagging too far behind uh, so I, I, I'd be interested to try to, to elevate some conversation around around those issues right no I, 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 I agree with you completely Sharon that would be uh, I think this is the perfect venue for talking about those sorts of things and then for some of us who are part of the Evergreen Development Initiative and for those who have a good development budget, um, then, you know, we can start looking at, you know, putting our money together to make those things happen. Yeah. There is an Evergreen catalogers list. That is a general catalogers list for Evergreen. Um, that probably a lot of those folks would probably have um, some opinions on bed frame. Um, I did put the link to the cataloging list in the chat. Um, and I was just looking at the, the list of the mailing list and the social leaders mailing list is not on here. That's the reason I didn't know about it. The um, cataloging working group also uh, has meetings every second Tuesday, yes, of the month at 
well, one o'clock my time, two o'clock Eastern. <laughs> Uh, so that would, to me, that would be a great place to start a discussion with bed frame because that's where your catalogers are at. Um, but then, yes, but the money wise would have to be a consortial discussion. Um, and I know the EDCI, um, bed frame has been talked about with EDCI a couple of times. So then back to, to Sharon's point, the, the, larger, more philosophical um, moving forward with Evergreen as a whole. And I know that generally the, the community works in a very organic way. And so Sharon, what would you propose? Do you have any ideas on how, how we can, what, or what we can do, what, 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 what facet of this can we do that would contribute to the community as a whole? Yeah, I guess I'm um, thinking about uh, it, it's if there's a way we could kind of gather up some of the strategic development concerns that are out there, and it might not just be at this table. Uh, maybe developers uh, will bring uh, some understanding about uh, development pieces, code pieces that we need to be mindful of. You know, for example, the Zool Zool to Angular that we we're still going through. We haven't finish that and there's a lot of uh, funding that needs to be done to get us through that uh, still. Um, so yeah, I think it's maybe a multi-pronged approach, but um, it, it would be, if I'd been anticipatory, it might have been a good topic for a, a conference. <laughs> uh, so that might be a way to, to bring it together, but um, yeah, I think it's just uh, having some of that strategic thinking and the community development table certainly brings a, a lot of issues, but not everybody's at that table. Right. Um, so, uh, I, I, yeah, maybe, maybe scheduling some calls where we bring different people together who bring different perspectives, not just consortial leaders, but really focusing on strategic development and what is it that um, we might have some blind spots around um, and that we really need to be thinking about the longevity of the software and uh, ensuring that that as an asset it's it's here for us you know five years out uh, and and what do we need to do to kind of steer the ship in that direction in a fundamental way and I, I just have concerns that we're just we're, we're missing some key pieces and not coalescing energy and funding around some of those um, those kinds of pieces well, I mean, one of the things that you can, um, one of the things the Hackaway was originally was designed to actually help do is to do some of that. Um, is to get the developers together in a room and talk about these fundamental um, changes that we need to make to the software, which is the one of the reasons why the web, one of the ways the web client actually got started was from a discussion in the Hackaway. Um, so, I mean, the hackaway is because, I mean, you get the room full of developers, they'll talk about anything. <laughs> um, you just give them a topic off they read into the far blue yonder. Um, but yeah, I mean, the hackaway is a good place to also bring up some of these discussions because, I mean, those are where, that's where your, your developers actually are. Um, at least they all try to go to the hackaway. Um, and, and, have it just sometimes just opening up a, a discussion on something that you're seeing as a, a issue on the developers list um, or in the general discussion list because you may come up and you may think it's an issue for you but then I may look at it and go oh that's a nice issue I have an opinion about that um, because I have opinions about lots of things you know thinking about what you were saying I, I know in the role that I'm playing, a lot of times, you know, if you compare, let's say your consortium is the water and the bigger evergreen world is the air, a lot of times my focus is on making sure that all the machinations of the organization that I'm responsible for is working well, and I don't spend a whole lot of time looking up in the air and thinking about the future and that kind of stuff. So I think that the having, being able to bring that kind of conversation in and, and you know, I think one of the things about this group of people 
maybe not we're the only ones, but we're some of the people that might have more of an opportunity to think strategically about funding and also have team members that we can push to or, you know, try to get involved in some of the different projects and that sort of thing. And so I think having that kind of conversation to help keep us thinking about bid frame or whatever the different kinds of, you know, technologies that we may be responsible for knowing about, but don't always keep um, tracking on all the time, you know, and, and sort of re-educating us on here's the things you need to be thinking about as a, as a community and as um, program leaders to be able to continue to push this stuff forward. I would find that really useful. And I think one of the things that we have to do, do the timeout because we, we have now reached our, our time. I'm sorry. Now that we just got warmed up and we're ready to roll, it's time to quit. So. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. The right idea ahead. of having uh, regular gatherings of this body, of this group of people, um, what do you guys think about quarterly, every half year? What, uh, you know, just getting on a hour or two long Zoom call, maybe inviting some of those other voices, that sort of thing? I actually like that idea. I'm, I'm totally open to it. Okay. Um, I'd be happy to set something up. We can dialogue on the email list. Um, in three months or something like that and and just give us a chance to sort of continue this conversation I'd like to kind of continue like you know exploring you know since we're having to wrap it up to kind of explore more of this on on the on the email list if, if we can keep the momentum going and you know just kind of see you know what can we coalesce um, as a group yeah okay. so very good the time was very short after all so <laughs> so sorry thank you so much for hosting us debbie Yes, thanks, Debbie. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you all for engaging in good discussion. And <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll actually see you and you know on, on a video call and you know whenever ben, Benjamin can get us scheduled. So thank you all so much. Thanks, thanks Elizabeth. Thanks, Debbie. Yeah. And I'm gonna be demoting all of you back to attendees. <laughs> well, I'm leaving to go to the other track. So <laughs> and we'll be uh, starting the next session uh, in eight minutes. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing some of you then. Thanks.